All right, one of the labs that we should be familiar with this semester is the preparation of T-butyl chloride. And here T-butyl chloride is the old common language, the old common name for uh, something that we would be naming differently now. And if you watch the lecture video on converting alcohols into halogens or halides, then um, you'd be familiar with the mechanism of this reaction. So the purpose of this video is to describe a little more about the reaction itself and how it's conducted in the lab, including a calculation of percent yield, so calculating the amount that you would expect to get, and then given the amount that you actually get, you can calculate a percent yield. So the overall reaction is one that I discussed in the lecture video, T-butyl alcohol in the presence of concentrated hydrochloric acid, the other reagent, turns into T-butyl chloride. Notice the more systematic naming here, 2-methyl-2-propanol and 2-chloro-2-methylpropane. Good names to know. People switch back and forth between common and systematic nomenclature all the time. Now, prior to arriving to lab, if you're going to do this in the lab, you would gather some data on T-butyl alcohol, T-butyl chloride, and water for comparison. T-butyl alcohol molecular weight is very important in calculating the yield you'd expect from this reaction. The boiling point is really important in terms of can you separate it from other liquids using a distillation. And then the density is good for a couple of reasons. One is the 0.781 grams per milliliter is a lower number than the one grams per milliliter of water. So what that would mean is the organic layers having lower densities than water would float on the top. So that's commonly the case. If you do an organic reaction, usually use something dissolved in water, either to wash the organic layer or as a reactant, and that'll sink to the bottom of the reaction vessel. Whereas the thing that's less dense is typically the organic stuff, and those solvents and reactants and products will go to the top of the test tube. So these densities will confirm that, that the organic materials are less dense and would float in the reaction, whereas the water is more dense. You also, for the reactant and the product, you want to be familiar with the molecular weights, so you can do calculations related to stoichiometry. So the product replacing a heavier chloride for the lighter OH group is going to have a greater molecular mass. So you can create a larger mass of product if the reaction goes well. And then the boiling point is much less, so it's easier to distill the product first. Okay, so that's a little overview of some of the data and why you might get it together before you do the reaction. And when I talked about the mechanism of this, I did not describe the competing, as they call it here, dehydration reaction, also known as an elimination reaction. And this is can often be the case that when you go through a carbocation intermediate, you can get an elimination product rather than the addition product. And we'll show the mechanism of that, but in this case, the t-butanol losing water would give you isobutene, also known as isobutylene or 2-methylpropene. But this uh, compound is a gas and would bubble out of the solution. So you would lose the carbon that you threw in there trying to get the chloride and end up with a gas escaping and flying away. And nobody wants that to happen to their expensive reagents. So let me describe a little bit the mechanism of that. That in the formation of the T-butyl chloride, you generate through an SN1 reaction this carbocation, the T-butyl carbocation. And one of the things that this will do is this carbon is electron deficient. It's not obeying the octet rule. It only has six electrons in its environment. And so what this will end up doing is trying to grab electrons nearby. So this pair of electrons can go from being a single bond between the carbon and the hydrogen. If there's any kind of base, 
in the area. Base generally has a lone pair of electrons. That base will go grab the H plus off a neighboring methyl group. And some might call this a beta hydrogen elimination. This is the alpha, the carbon of interest. The beta is one next to it. And when this hydrogen is plucked off by a base, this single bond can turn into a second bond between these two carbons. And so that's where you would end up with the carbon-carbon double bond in the product. The rest of the molecule, the other methyls, stay the same. And you end up getting this organic gas, the isobutene, it's called isobutylene, or 2-methyl propene would be the more systematic name because then you have one, two, three carbons in a row with off the second carbon a methyl. So pretty straightforward there. Uh, experimentally, when you go to do this reaction, there's a couple things that we take care of here. One is that when you have this hydrochloric acid, you're going to cool it in an ice bath to as low a temperature as you can reasonably get it without having it freeze. So if you cool it for a long time in an ice bath, it'll reach the zero degrees of the ice bath. Sometimes people will make it a salt water bath, and that'll be an even lower temperature. But it's really important to keep this cool because this elimination reaction I talked about, where the carbocation can turn into an alkene by the elimination when it's deprotonated, that'll happen the warmer it is. So if you try to do this at room temperature, you'll form the carbocation pretty effectively, but then most of the carbocation would decompose and form the isobutylene, which would escape your reaction. If you keep this cold, then the carbocation will last long enough for the chloride nucleophile to find it. So if you watch the lecture video on the mechanism of this reaction, you'll see what we want to happen is the carbocation would be trapped by the chloride and not decompose by deprotonation into the isobutylene. You've got to make sure this is vigorously shaken. So originally it said gently mix the instructions and that wasn't sufficient to affect a nice homogeneous solution, we need the reactants to get in contact with each other and the hydrochloric acid has got to get to the alcohol to protonate it to form the carbocation. And then, so we want to keep it cold and well mixed for at least five minutes. And so you shake it every half minute or minute, you keep it in the ice bath when you can, and then after a while when you think the reaction is totally uh, complete, then you'll remove it from the cold bath and allow it to warm up. And this reaction and then the important separation will occur over typically a 15 minute period. So the organic materials will float to the top and the things that dissolve in water will go into the water and be at the bottom. And then the product boils at a fairly low temperature so it will be evaporating the whole time that you're trying to uh, work it up. So that's why this big underlined bold all caps screaming at you to work quickly so you're going to want to know ahead of time what you're going to do and prepare your materials so you don't have to be running around the lab while your product evaporates. So you're going to wash the crude product with some water to remove the aqueous wastes that would dissolve in the water and then you're going to, if there's any trace acid in there the base will react with the acid and neutralize it and then the carbonic acid decomposes to form carbon dioxide so you have some carbon dioxide come off if this is neutralizing any acid, which it does. Then after you've neutralized the acid you will generally wash again with DI water to remove any traces of water soluble impurities such as the excess sodium hydrogen carbonate that might be there. Then you remove the aqueous layer and that'll be a discard because your product is the organic 
I often would add in a step to transfer your organic layer into a dry test tube to make sure there's no large drops of water adhering to the test tube or reaction vessel that you've been using because the calcium chloride isn't going to handle large drops of water. It's only going to handle trace water. So then you make sure you add your drying agent to remove the trace water that's dissolved in the solution or floating around in the solution. And then when your solution looks clear, so when you can see through and it's not cloudy at all, it will be a clear colorless solution, then the water's generally been removed. So cloudy organic solvents typically are cloudy because they have water in them. And we want to eliminate that water. And then we go ahead and do a simple distillation with our so-called dried crude product. And I always thought that was weird that they called it a dried product when it's clearly a liquid, but they just mean the water has been removed. So it's not really dry, it's still very wet, like all liquids, but it's water free. So I would, if I were rewriting the world, I would say that this is a water free crude product rather than dry because it's it's a liquid, it's wet. Okay, the, um, so you distill your product. Now, the other thing that to be concerned with that organic chemists really were, should be interested in is how much product are you going to get from this reaction? And so there's several steps often that you won't see in general chemistry or you might not see in organic chemistry, but it's worth writing out. So if you measure out five milliliters of the tert butanol, we don't normally do stoichiometric uh, calculations with volumes. We need to convert them to masses. So the volume times the density. And so this is where you want to have that data that I had shown before. Your density of your starting material is 0.781 grams per milliliter. And so if you multiply the volume times the density, you're going to get the mass of the T-butyl alcohol. So let's do that. 5 times 0.781 equals 3.905 grams of terbutanol. And then normally you would um, need to find the limiting reagent and do some stoichiometric calculations to do that. But in this case, this is the expensive reagent, the terbutanol. The hydrochloric acid we put in an excess, so we don't have to worry about what the limiting reagent is. It's pretty much told to us that it's the t-butanol. So we're not going to worry about how much hydrochloric acid is in there. We are going to worry about converting to moles because stoichiometric calculations are not done with volumes unless you're dealing with gases. They're not dealing with masses because the balanced chemical reaction is written in moles of material, so we have to convert to moles. So the molecular mass of the t-butyl alcohol is the 74.12 grams per mole. So if one mole is 74.12 grams, then we can calculate out the number of moles that are here. So 3.905 divided by 74.12. And it's a good idea for you to play along when I'm doing this. Find out that you have 0.05268 moles of t-butanol. And so now that you have the number of moles of your starting material, you can convert it to number of moles of your product with the appropriate mole ratio. And here, the mole ratios in most organic reactions are boring. Because it's usually the limiting reactant, you have one mole of that. The reagent you're reacting with it, you have one mole of that. You get the product, one mole of that, plus the byproduct, one mole of that. So if the coefficients are one to one to one to one ratio, the number of moles of this reacting it's the number of moles of that reacting, the number of moles of this forming, the number of moles of that forming. It's just pretty boring. We're still going to write out that the number of moles of terbutanol times one terbutyl chloride 
for one terbutanol gives us the same number of moles of product as the number of moles of starting material. So this ratio is not to be ignored even though it's boring and times one and divided by one doesn't change the number it does change the units essentially or the, the material we're talking about changes from terbutanol to terbutyl chloride and we want to show why we can do that, why we can just switch them. And then once you have the number of moles of the product then you multiply that by its molecular mass to get the mass of the product that we would expect. So if this reaction goes well, we would expect 4.8 grams of the terp butyl chloride product. And we know it evaporates pretty quickly and we're doing this in open air, so we're probably not gonna get that much, but if we're careful and we work quickly, we should get a good amount of material, at least a couple of grams to work with and distill so that we can isolate some pure product. And, um, and then of course, write home and tell your parents about it. What awesome things you would do in the lab. Um, we are going to post a video of somebody doing this reaction with a different setup and a different amount of material than we did it. Um, it's often really interesting to work in different labs or to make the same material using different procedures to get an idea of the range of techniques that people would employ and which different equipment people could use to get the reaction to happen. So that's a little introduction into a lab that I wish we were doing preparation of t-butyl chloride. It goes really nicely and if you get good and efficient and crisp with your techniques you get a lot more material but generally everybody gets something so everybody gets some material to distill and be happy with. Um, hopefully you're happy and healthy and learning a lot even though we're not able to do the experiments right now.